A long, long time ago. It was February 3rd, 1959. Hello, baby. Rock and roll was still in its infancy. Golly gee, what have you done to me? But one of its darkest days began to unfold. We interrupt this program for a special news bulletin. Three young singers who soared to the heights of show business on the current rock and roll craze were killed today in the crash of a light plane in an Iowa snow flurry. The singers were identified as Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, and J.P. Richardson, known professionally as the Big Bopper. The cause of the crash was due to inclement weather conditions. Whew. On the day the music died, it... it it, it always brings me back to that plane crash. I mean, they were the godfathers of rock and roll, and they kind of showed you how it was done. It was a really big deal, performers of that magnitude passing away in one accident. Fans were in shock. No one could believe that three of the biggest stars in rock and roll were suddenly gone forever, all in one day. But February made me shiver With every paper I deliver they may have called it the day the music died, but some of that music was born right here in the Bayou City. Holy sweet man. How that happened is really the story of the Big Bopper himself. He's an icon to us. I knew his name probably um, before I knew how to talk. <laughs> J.P. Richardson, or Jape as friends called him, was born in Sabine Pass, Texas on October 24, 1930, just a stone's throw from Port Arthur, where another iconic rock singer would be born, and died tragically, Janis Joplin. Young J.P. grew up alongside two brothers in Beaumont. He eventually became a radio disc jockey at Beaumont's KTRM Radio. He was a radio DJ, and he enjoyed the recording environment and was real familiar with the production environment. When he met the daughter of a Louisiana sugarcane farmer, he was smitten. It was love at first sight. And on April 18, 1952, J.P. married Adrian Friju, or Titsi as she was called, so named by her father, who said she was no bigger than a Titsi fly. Then the couple welcomed their first child, Deborah Joy, who was the apple of her daddy's eye. Eventually, J.P. developed an on-air character persona he called the Big Bopper. He took his name from a popular dance craze of the day, the Bop, where bopping on the dance floor was all the rage. I ain't got no money, honey. He didn't grow up rich, you know. He, he played that character and he, and he enjoyed that time and then he went home and, and enjoyed his family. J.P. was mild-mannered. But the big bopper, his alter ego, well, that was a jive-talking hipster who filled in his 240-pound frame with a big belly laugh. <laughs> and crazy antics. You know what I like. The big bopper began playing the music of another character who went by a moniker, the Hillbilly Cat, also known as Elvis Presley. The Big Bopper welcomed young Elvis to Beaumont for a series of concerts back in June of 1955. I mean, he was the voice down here in Southeast Texas at KTRM. When he went into the Army, he was a radar operator, I believe. So he liked audio equipment. After a two-year stint in the Army, J.P. then returned to his DJ post at KTRM. On April 29, 1957, J.P. set out to break the world's record for the longest continuous radio broadcast. Surviving on Lone Star beer, knee-high soda, and ice cream malts made with raw eggs. After five days, J.P. broke the record while playing All Shook Up by Elvis Presley. He had stayed on the air for 122 hours and 8 minutes, playing 1,821 records. He also lost 35 pounds during the ordeal. Now that he was truly a celebrity, the Big Bopper was bitten by the bug to be in show business himself. He turned his sights on becoming a songwriter and a performer. In the summer of 1958, the Big Bopper headed down the highway en route to Houston. Well, the fact that he recorded Chantilly Lace here is kind of stitched into the history of Sugar Hill. The story of Chantilly Lace is quite fascinating because it's actually the B-side of the single. The Purple People Eater meets the Witch Doctor, and Chantilly Lace was supposed to be the B-side. Cut here at Gold Star Sugar Hill. Well, I guess the Bopper forgot that he needed a B-side, so he was driving from Beaumont to Houston for the recording session. And there in the car, he wrote the lyrics to Chantilly Lace. And had it completely finished by the time he reached the Houston recording studio called Gold Star. And of course, really didn't have a song until he got with the musicians. They kind of sat and rehearsed it a bit. 
until he turned a set of lyrics into a song. The record was first released in Houston, and the Bayou City went wild over the Big Bopper. My mom loved the Big Bopper. I mean, we had all the records I grew up with. Hello, baby. Barry Coffing is a Houston-raised, award-winning Hollywood producer, songwriter, and music supervisor, having co-written the number one hit, How Do You Talk to an Angel, and placing music in such films as The Blind Side. And my mom thought, you know, Buddy Holly was tough and, you know, that kind of stuff. Hello, a little red riding hood. I heard about you, Alice, all been good. He was fun and sort of laid the groundwork for the Motown people that would follow. Oh, honey! You know, him and Buddy Holly brought a lot of attention to Texas and, and what was going on down here in the Gulf Coast. On August 9th, 1958, the nation met the bopper. Chantilly Lace and the big bopper. Hello, baby! Yeah, this is the big bopper speaking. He was different. He wore leopard skin jackets on stage. I mean, who did that? He understood that it's having a good time, putting on a show, being outrageous, and getting away with it. Oh, baby, that's what I like. When I think of the Big Bopper, uh, of course, I always think of Chantilly Lace. <laughs> that, that, that song, just my daddy always sang it around the house and, and always knew him by his first name because well, if you knew him by his, by his name, J.P. Richardson, then, then you felt like you knew him more. Like Elvis and Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper was among the first Southern stars to play before integrated audiences. The music did not discriminate. The music it was just so important to him and, and being creative and being able to work with all different kinds of people. By years in, Chantilly Lace was a third most played song of 1958 and it had topped the Billboard pop charts at number six. The Houston-born song went gold, selling over a million records by January 1959. A classic. Sadly, the bopper never got to receive his gold record. He only had so many months as the big bopper, and really hitting that, that, that point where he was actually getting his music spread around and people were listening to it. And he had all these hits, and then, you know, you know tragically, he was taken away. There's just a, a very wonderful place in my heart every time I think about him. Every time I hear Chantilly Lace, I smile. It's just, it's a, it's a happy thought. Oh, baby, that's a lot of life. Dan Workman is a top record producer and engineer, having worked with such legendary artists as ZZ Top, Clay Walker, and Beyonce. He is also president and CEO of Houston's Sugar Hill Studios. The music business and music is something that's really near and dear to me. And when you think of three performers all passing away at once, it makes me hopeful that that will never happen again. You know, it's sort of like, why do they have to be on a small plane together? And the three men I admire most, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, they caught the last train for the coast the day the music died. Still to come, why were all three singers on that doomed flight? And today, is it possible the bopper's spirit resides in Houston? You know, if there's any ghosts that are around here, you know, the big bopper might be in this room, but he might just as easily be in the control room. And later, we're going retro on our runway. Why 50s fashion is in again. A long, long time ago. During the winter of 1959, rock and roll was on thin ice, literally. That's because concert promoters launched a tour to bring music's biggest stars to the frozen tundra of the Midwest. Like Buddy Holly, singer J.P. Richardson had a pregnant wife, and both young stars needed money for their growing families. The sure way to get it was to tour. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, little darling. The two Texans joined singer Richie Valens and other rising stars for the Winter Dance Party Tour, a zigzagging trek across the nation's Midwest in the dead of winter for three and a half weeks. But the tour seemed doomed from the start. Sub-zero temperatures, winter blizzards, broken down tour buses with no heat. Playing 11 shows in 11 days finally took its toll on the young stars. By the time they reached the surf ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa, Buddy Holly didn't want to spend another night on a freezing bus. 
He chartered a private plane to take himself and his two bandmates on to their next gig near Fargo, North Dakota. The Big Bopper had the flu, so he asked Buddy's bass player, a young Texan named Waylon Jennings, if he could have his seat on the plane. And Waylon gave up his seat. He went on to carry the, the torch for Texas music. Then Richie Valens also got a seat on the ill-fated flight after he won a coin toss for the last remaining seat with Buddy's guitar player, another Texan, Tommy Alsup. The three music stars boarded a Beechcraft Bonanza single-engine plane at nearby Mason City Airport. The plane departed at 1 a.m. About four minutes after takeoff, the small plane disappeared into the dark, snowy night. The next morning, the plane's wreckage was discovered just eight miles from the airport. Investigators found that all three music stars and their 21-year-old pilot, Roger Peterson, were killed instantly. The bodies remained in a frozen cornfield for over 10 hours before they were found in the 18-degree weather. J.P. Richardson was 28. Buddy Holly was only 22. And Richie Valens was just 17. Back then, I mean, it had to be in, in, just overwhelming. Buddy Holly just putting string stuff on rock music, like what would he have done had he lived? Richie Valens, I mean, he was super young. You know, what would he have done? The Big Bopper, how many more hits would he have had? Very, very sad. And, um, but if you believe in the afterlife, which, which I do, then um, one of these days I'm going to get to jam with him. So that, that, that's, that, that's the way I look at it. At JP's funeral back in Beaumont, a guitar-shaped wreath was sent from the king himself, Private First Class Elvis Presley, who was still overseas completing his service in the army. Elvis and his manager, Colonel Parker, also sent a telegram expressing heartfelt sympathy and prayers. I can't remember if I cried when I read about his widowed bride. Among the items recovered from the crash site, the receipt for the Big Bopper's airfare, for $36. And another item which will be brought back 50 years later. That's my father's briefcase. It was here 50 years ago tonight. And he told mom, I'll be working at home tonight, ladies and gentlemen. It's going home. In just his brief short time in the music business, the Big Bopper had already become a legend. In fact, J.P.'s music grew stronger and stronger. Almost three months after his death, J.P.'s son, Jay, was born. And that same month, lightning struck. Shh, white lightning. People don't realize that he wrote uh, White Lightning, which was a huge hit for George Jones. Went all the way to number one on the country charts. Then a year later, Lightning struck again. He also wrote Running Bear, which was a big hit for Johnny Preston that was also cut here. And the background vocals on Running Bear are actually George Jones and the Big Bopper. The Big Bopper's influence would be echoed by many artists through the years, especially in one area, the music video. My dad is the innovator of the music video. Oh, honey. Dad was doing so many things, from his talent agency and the, and the people he had in his talent agency to Big Bopper publishing, to his performing, to still his radio duties. People don't realize that much about him. When they hear his music, they know maybe Chantilly Lace. They don't know all the things that he's done. I think he sets a lot of trends for things to come much later. You know, you can lead this all the way to Kiss. A no progression from the rock star image of, of the Big Bopper all the way through to what happens today. I like the Mark Twain quote, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. The next generation, you can see the trends coming over, but there's always something a little different about it when it comes back again. And as for donning leopard print, well, even the hottest singers of today are still wearing it. It would have been amazing just to see what he would have done had he had lived longer than he did. People build on top of other artists. Every artist that that comes after takes something from it and does their own twist on it. The 50s will never die. Even like the Buddy Holly glasses, you know, it's like he made, like my mom thought those were tough in her words. Then, then they went through a period where they were nerdy, now they're back. During the past 55 years since the tragedy, no one has done more to keep the Big Bopper's music alive than his son, Jay. He grew up not really knowing who his father was. At age 28, 
the same age his father's life ended, Jay made it his life's mission to learn everything he could about the father he never knew. He moved to Katy, Texas and began performing his famous father's songs. And then from there on, there was nothing but singing going on in the house. Then last year, Jay suffered from major heart problems. And on August 21st, 2013, the Big Bopper Jr. also died. He was only 54, gone too soon, like father, like son. JP's family found comfort in feeling that father and son finally got to meet at last. I'm sure they've met a lot in, in, their, in uh, my dad's dreams, but uh, you know, I'm sure it was a special moment. We got hundreds and hundreds of letters from amazing people all over the world yeah. in the last few months, and it's just so inspiring that, you know, that many people care to um, sit down and let us know their story and how my, you know, my dad and grandpa touched their life. Of course, we all know that music really never dies. The music never died. I mean, you could ask anybody, right? And every February 3rd, the world recalls three legends who lost their lives for the music they loved. Buddy Holly was credited with numerous studio innovations, creating a sound that famously went on to inspire the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and even a young 17-year-old musician who was at the winter dance party in Duluth, Minnesota, two nights before the crash, a folk singer named Bob Dylan. Teen idol Richie Valens would also leave his mark in music by inspiring later generations through his Latino roots. Both Buddy Holly and Richie Valens have taken their rightful places in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But to date, the Big Bopper remains left out in the cold. Uh, let me in, honey. This is the Big Bopper knocking. To think he's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame it seems kind of ridiculous. That's, that's not right. He gets my vote. Just. It doesn't seem quite right that, that he wouldn't get his due like that. That the Hall of Fame would be missing a very key piece if the Big Bopper were not put in. And I believe that the family is owed that. Because he was so flamboyant and fun, I don't think he got, you know, the right, uh, the right credit for some of the other stuff he did. You know, it's like, you know, do up. I don't understand a word they're saying. They make up words. They're terrible, you know. But now there's a new bopper in town. Goodbye, baby. The Big Whopper's grandkids and Katie are picking up where their father left off. It's our responsibility to keep that going, and, um, you know, we're proud of our family and our history, and we want to share that. As for Houston's Gold Star Recording Studio, it eventually became Sugar Hill, and today it remains a working studio, having churned out hits from the Big Bopper all the way to Beyonce. Houston has an amazing history of hit records being cut here and viable artists that have lived here. Houston does play a big role in keeping the music alive. <laughs> I think Chantilly Lace is one of the most important things that's ever been recorded here in this city. Today, some say they still feel the bopper's spirit, helping to make music where his first hit was made. Quite often if I'm working in here by myself, and I'm working on interesting music or stuff, I sort of look around and I feel like, you know, somebody's watching. Something's, something's looking over us and kind of keeping keeping tabs on what we're doing over here. If there's any ghosts that are around here, you know, the Big Bopper might be in this room, but he might just as easily be in the control room. There's a feeling in this building, and I've had other musicians that have come, that have come in here have told me that, other singers have said that there's always been an interesting feeling when they come into this building, that the, the walls talk. In the meantime, the music will keep playing and not fade away. I love it, love it, not fade away. Music, you know, it's beautiful, you know, it's, it's, it's not stopping. I think music is one of the few things that won't die. I mean, someday we will run out of oil. Someday there will be a cure for cancer. There will never be a day. As long as we're alive, music's alive. But something touched me deep inside the day. The music died.